Robots are coming, and so is a jobs revolution. Estimates nearly 42% of jobs are at a high risk of being affected by automation in the next decade or two. We're going to see more and more things that look like science fiction, and fewer and fewer things that look like jobs. Automate this. Welcome to the fourth and final installment of our series, Automate This, all about the future of work in an artificially intelligent world. Over the past three weeks, we've explored how machine learning technologies are already transforming the way we live and work from driverless trucks in Alberta. If I had to give it uh, one word, automation worries me. To life-saving medical tools. My treatment was considerably changed as a result of these technologies. Even computer programs that can edit videos in real time. You could take 10 minutes of audio from someone, put it into this machine, and then you can type words and it will speak them in a way that you literally cannot tell that that person did not say those things. The programs in development today are already learning how to perform tasks that once seemed like the exclusive domain of humans. We made experiments to try to answer the question, can people make the difference between an original piece from, let's say, Chopin or Brahms and a piece generated by a machine? And then we find that people can't really make the difference. And there's no reason to believe the technology will stop there. The Advances in the last even five years have been startling. If the technology continues to progress at its current rate, artificial intelligence has the potential to radically change not just our careers, but our entire way of life. And we are already starting to feel the political implications of those changes. Counties that had more routine work were more likely to vote for Trump than they had been to vote for Mitt Romney. You look at Vladimir Putin, who just a couple of weeks ago put out probably the most honest thing I think I've ever heard him say, which was whoever controls artificial intelligence in the future controls the world and the reason he knows that is because once you control that and you control what it is capable of doing you can control anything it is hard to fully imagine what an artificially intelligent world would actually look like let alone to plan for one but my next guest has laid out one possible blueprint of what's ahead dr yuval noah harari is a lecturer in history at the hebrew university of jerusalem and the author of the acclaimed books sapiens and homo deus a brief history of tomorrow He's documented the many ways that the technologies of the 21st century could fundamentally transform human society and how those projects could lead us awry. Dr. Harari is in Tel Aviv. Dr. Harari, good morning. Welcome to Day 6. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. You're predicting the possible rise of what you call the useless class. Who are they? Well, just as the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century created the urban working class, so in the 21st century, we might see the creation of the unworking class, of the useless class, uh, people who just have no economic value because they can't do anything better than an AI or a robot, and therefore also they don't have much political power. Can you imagine what the lives would be like for the people you describe as the useless class, for the people who are left behind by the revolution? There are many different possibilities and scenarios. What we need to realize is that technology is never deterministic. The same technology can be used to create very different kinds of societies. So like uh, in the 20th century, you could use the technology of the Industrial Revolution to create a communist dictatorship or a fascist regime or a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. And the same is true with the rise of artificial intelligence and robotics and machine learning. Some people envision a wonderful situation in which all the dreary jobs are taken care of by the machines, and humans are supported through some kind of universal basic income scheme. Yes. And they can devote themselves to hobbies and art and meditation and religion or whatever. And then there are, of course, the more dystopian uh, scenarios in which humankind is split into a tiny, all powerful elite and the vast underclass who has got no economic power, no political power and whose life uh, is totally at the mercy of the elite. So what happens to that class? Won't that class eventually turn against the elite that controls everything? The question is whether they'll have the power. We are used to the age of the masses in which if the lower classes are unhappy about the political and social situation, they can stage a revolution. Yes. But in the age of the masses, the masses could stage a revolution because ultimately they were vital for the economy and for the political system. Mm -hmm. Even in a dictatorship, 
you needed millions of people to serve as common soldiers in the army and as common workers in the factories and offices. Right. So they had real power. The upper classes, the, the high caste, which dominates all the new technology, they won't exploit the poor. They just won't need them. Mm -hmm. And it's much more difficult to rebel against irrelevance than against exploitation because you're expendable. I mean, some people say, I'm not sure if it's true or not, it's, it's, it's too early to say, but some people argue that what we saw in the last few years with the rise of Donald Trump and Brexit is the first new types of revolt, revolts of people who still have some political power, but are losing their economic power and they try to do something before it's too late, mm -hmm. before they are completely cut off from the sources of power. Not everyone is convinced, though, that, that computers will overtake humans in, in certain tasks, leading to this dystopian idea that you're describing. Creativity, jobs that require empathy, and these people may still be vital in a kind of post-technological revolution world. Why are you convinced that technology is going to make so many different fields obsolete? Well, I, I'm not completely convinced, of course. It's only a possibility. Nobody knows for sure. Um, I do think that there will be new jobs for humans, I'm just not convinced there'll be enough. Mm -hmm. So you could have, a, I don't know, a 40% of the population being employed in wonderful and very productive new human jobs, but you still have 60% without any job at all. And that's a catastrophe. Yes. The other problem is that it's not enough to just create new jobs for humans. You need to retrain people to fulfill these jobs. So let's say that you don't need taxi drivers and you don't need textile workers, but you have amazing new jobs, creative jobs in, say, the arts or in designing new wonderful computer games. The problem is that if you think about a 40-year-old unemployed textile worker in Bangladesh, he or she just don't have the skills to design virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. And the problem is worse because the AI revolution will not be a single watershed event. So even the new jobs within 10 or 20 years might be automated. Yes. So you have to do it again and again. And, and, and this opens also a philosophical question, like because work does provide people with the source of community and identity with more than an income. So if we don't have work anymore, will we find purpose in our day-to-day -day lives? Will there be a kind of existential crisis or does that even matter? I think that these are really the, the biggest questions about meaning and purpose. Um, and I'm, I'm not totally pessimistic. Jobs is just one way of providing humans with meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, children seem to, to live a very fulfilled life without having any jobs at all. And humans often find meaning and purpose, you know, in, in games, in hobbies. It's a question of how we educate them. You have said that the powers of biotechnology and computer algorithms are far more potent than steam and the telegraph. So, yes. so what sets these new technologies apart from the advances of, say, the Industrial Revolution, which you know was negotiated before by a workforce? Well, previously, almost all technological advance was about controlling the world outside. Now, the, the, the next revolution which consists of a merger between infotech and biotech will enable humankind to gain control of the world inside us. We have not seen anything like it for thousands of years. The second big difference is that until today, uh, the technology always remained a tool in the hands of humans and humans were making the ultimate decisions what to do with the trains, what to do with the radio and so forth. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But now what we are going to see is a shift in authority from humans to algorithms, more and more decisions about what to do in the world. So questions like whom to hire, even what to do in my personal life. When a person asks himself or herself, what should I uh, study in, in college or where should I work? You will not ask yourself or your friends or your parents. You will ask Google or Facebook who knows you far better than anybody. So th that's interesting to me because we also are looking at Google and Facebook and, and tech giant companies as being almost a replacement for government or perhaps even religion in that case. What, yes. what is the role that they will play? Uh, how much power will they exercise? How many levers will they pull? And what will the role of government be in the dystopia that you're imagining? First of all, it's not necessarily a dystopia. 
And also, it's not clear where the line will pass between government and the tech giants. Mm -hmm. It could go either way. Either the tech giants actually become the government, or the government uh, monopolizes these kinds of technologies. And it could go in different ways in different countries. In a place like China, for example, I could imagine that the government will fulfill the role that the big tech giants are fulfilling in, in North America. You have said that figuring out how to use future technologies wisely is the most important question facing humanity today. Do you yes. think that the average worker in 2017 or the governments that regulate and oversee them, do you think that they're prepared for the changes that are coming? Absolutely not. What I see at least is that the political system is largely ignoring uh, this problem. Uh, the AI revolution is still hardly a blip on our political radar. Uh -huh. And if you think, for example, about the, the last election in the US, so there was a lot of talk about the job market with Trump frightening voters that the Mexicans and Chinese will take their jobs. Uh -huh. But nobody even mentioned the idea that actually it's the robots and computers that will take the jobs. So at least today, there is no serious discussion in the political system about the AI revolution. And I find it very, very disconcerting because if we don't take decisions, the free market will take the decisions on our behalf. And I don't trust the free market to make the best decisions for humankind. Dr. Harari, thank you for having this discussion with us today. My pleasure. Dr. Yuval Harari is a lecturer in history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the author of Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. You can find out more about Dr. Harari's ideas and our entire Automate This series, all at cbc.ca slash day six.